Welcome to another exciting Treehouse Author Talk via Zoom. We are so pleased. This event is part of the 24th annual Utah Humanities Book Festival. This annual free festival is the Utah Humanities gift to the community, allowing us to explore all sorts of ideas by interacting with great writers. The complete program is available at www.utahumanities.org. And before we welcome our special guest, let me also welcome Lynn Goodwin, Treehouse Museum's director, who is handling the technical aspects of tonight's event. Right. And I am Wes Whitby. I'm the programs manager for Treehouse Children's Museum, and I'm your host for tonight. Also, uh, for those of you who did not notice, Seychelles is here with us tonight, providing American Sign Language interpretation, courtesy of Utah Humanities. So again, to make sure that you can see the interpreter uh, where you are, uh, make sure that you pin the interpreter on your screen so that you can have the interpreter with you throughout our event tonight. And don't forget that you can ask questions tonight and respond because April is going to be asking questions of you too. And we want your input. Just text the presenters through the Zoom chat feature and we'll relay your questions and answers to our guest. We need your ideas to be part of the discussion. So I'm going to encourage all of you not to be shy and not be intimidated by the wall of silence that sometimes happens at these Zoom presentations. Um, and get your fingers texting or typing and, and, and join us. And then uh, last of all, before I introduce our guest, uh, stick around because at the end, from among those of you who are signed in and present at the end of the webinar, we will draw some lucky names to win a signed copy of the book that we're focusing on tonight. And you're going to want a copy of that. We'll also uh, have uh, links uh, through April uh, on her uh, website where you can get more information to build bigger curriculum and uh, more activities based on what she's gonna share with us tonight. With that said, folks, let us welcome our special guest. She's been to Treehouse before, which is brilliant. And we asked her here last year to focus on her fantastic book, Golden Locks and the Three Pirates for our pirate party. It's beyond terrific to have her back. And uh, she's not only super fun uh, as an author of over a dozen books for children, but she has experience as an editor and a teacher at the Rhode Island School of Design. She's someone who really knows the ins and outs of reading and writing. Children, families, educators, fans, will you please put your silent Zoom hands together with a round of applause for April Jones Prince. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Wes. I so appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Lynn for helping us coordinate and to the Utah Humanities Council for hosting us and to Seychelles for being here too. Um, we are gonna have some fun this evening. Thank you for joining us on a Saturday night. So as Wes said, my name is April Jones Prince. I am an author. I visit a lot of schools for all ages. So kids just like you, I teach college kids how to make books. I, um, I love words. I've been a bookseller, a book reviewer. I'm just surrounded by words all the time. I'm what's called a logophile. That means you love words. So we are gonna have a celebration of words and stories and ideas. And I know that you friends are story people because you're treehouse people, right? Step into a story. So this is a really wonderful connection. Um, so as Wes said, we would love to have you interact. Don't be shy. None of us bite. I'm like 2,000 miles away in Massachusetts, so I promise to use my best manners, but we want to hear from you. There are no silly questions. There are no wrong answers. Um, this is a, a dialogue as much as it can be, so, um, so get those typing fingers and thumbs ready. We would love to hear from you. So the book that I'm going to share with you, and I don't know if I should call this a book or books, it's called You Are a Reader, but it does book gymnastics, and it's also You Are a Writer. It's two books in one, and believe it or not, it meets in the middle, so we have two stories that come together. This is called the Tet Besh book, two books in one. It's called Head to, Head to Foot, I think is what that means. So think a little bit about why I made a two-sided book about reading and writing. Why would those two things go together? So think a little bit about that. 
And also think about what it means to be a reader. So we are all readers, right? Do you have to read books to be a reader? What do you think? We love books, right? But do you have to read books to be a reader? Because I'm thinking I'm reading a lot during the day and it's not always books, right? So does anyone want to put in the chat other things that they might read besides books? Here's some ideas. If I wanted to read, um, like I'm thinking Wes might read things like song lyrics or scripts for a play. Always reading I'm thinking, those kinds of things. Right? I'm thinking Miss Lynn might be reading some fairy tales. Those might be in a book or not. Oh, okay. the news. Yeah. Absolutely. Read a lot of the news. Labels and signs. Closed captions. Awesome. What would you read if you wanted to um, make a batch of cookies that you didn't know how to make? What could you read? Could you read a recipe to know how to do that? Well, Recipes, huge, you got it. Huge what would you read? At our house. Somebody might have already said this. What what can you read if you don't know how to get somewhere? What could you read? I think we had earlier we had somebody say we signs. Some signs, right? And maps. Right? What about if you want to play a game and you don't know how to play it? Lego instructions, yes. So in Lego instructions, you're kind of reading the pictures, right? Because they don't usually have words, right? Instructions, exactly, for a game called Life, right? So there are tons of things that we can read um, that we don't necessarily think of because we always think of books or magazines. And so you're gonna see some of these in the book. And we also can write lots of different things, right? You don't have to be a storyteller to be a writer. Right? You don't have to write books, although it's really fun to write books. Could we write things like, this is postcard, right? Could we write postcards? What do you write if you get a really fabulous birthday present? What do you write afterwards to the person who gave it to you? Thanks, right? Maybe a thank you note. Exactly a thank you card, April, right? I it's still like fun to get mail. That's a lost art. <laughs> Some of us are still card. really paper people, right? And you get a stamp at the post office and put it in the mail. Um, does anybody write, this is vintage. It has a lock and everything. Does anybody keep a journal or write in a diary? That's something else you could write. Oh, lists, yes. Who else is a list person, right? I'm a total list person, right? Exactly, I love that. Somebody also I saw said that they read book spines, right? Like the, the spine of the book is this part, right? It's the title, it's a little bit hard for you to see that. Could we read jokes? I'm gonna warm you up with a couple book jokes. <laughs> what does a book do in the winter? It puts on its book jacket. This is the jacket, right? The covering. How about, what do planets like to read? like planets in the sky, comet books, right? So jokes are really fun to read, right? You don't always have to dive into a whole book. So as I read this, I am going to screen share because there's a lot of little pieces of art that I want you to be able to see. So um, if you can't see the screen share, I'm gonna pop it up right now, but if you can't see it, just holler in the chat, okay. Thumbs up to the panelists. Can you see the screen share? We've got it. Okay, so I'm calling this evening reading and writing are your superpowers. So we're gonna talk about what that means. Oh, the other thing I wanted you to keep in mind as we're reading is to listen for some juicy words. This thing behind yeah. me says juicy. Can I, can I ask about that? I mean, we're not, <laughs> we're not just talking about words that are said in a way that you need a towel, like <laughs> right. sibilant or... <laughs> I mean, what, what, what else are you meaning by juicy words? What's the juicy word? So I'm thinking words that are spicy and flavorful and not tired and overused, right? Like when we say that something is nice, well, what does that really mean, right? We're not really sure. We'll talk a little bit more about juicy words, but interesting words that have a lot of flavor. They might even be fun to say. Some words are fun to say 
in your mouth, right? Like scramble, sputter, right? They make your mouth do interesting things. So um, we'll talk about that. So listen for some juicy words in here. So this is the beginning. We're gonna start with You Are a Reader and it's by April Jones Prince, illustrated by Christine Davigny. All right, here's the beginning. Scan, sound, simmer, think. You can guzzle words and ink. Guzzle, I think that's a juicy word. Do you open, swipe and tap, maybe listen in a lap? You might borrow, you might shop, you can even read and swap. Spy a word that makes you scowl, trips you up with tricky vowels, stretch that word, sound it out, give your letter sounds a scout. You might stumble, you might sigh. <sighs> Ever looked like this before? But readers practice, grow, and fly. Don't give up, it's worth your while. Search until you find the thing that makes your reading radar ping. And when a story makes you grin, clap and cheer and shriek again. That's what we do with the stories that we really love, right? Storybooks aren't quite your speed, so many other things to read. Labels, programs, comic books, a recipe that you can cook, magazines, maps, directions, menus full of sweet selections. There's cozy reading on your bed or inside a fort instead. Gather around on rug or chair. Share a story anywhere. Favorite stories steal your heart with characters who stand apart. They're brave and strong with clever wit, style, pluck, or downright grit. Their worlds feel rich and real. Their actions make you gasp <gasps> or squeal. Reading is like milk and bread, feeds your thirsty, hungry head. You can dream, imagine, muse, slip on someone else's shoes. Find the facts, learn the truth. You're an information sleuth. Tallest tales or stories true, they're an author's gift to you. So soak them up, drink them down, because you are a reader. <gasps> and readers are writers, and writers are readers, and readers are writers. And the whole thing flips around, right? We flip the book around, and then we start from the other side, which is you are a writer. See if you can spy any of those same characters that were in readers in the writer's version. So you are a writer. Wake, watch, wonder, plot. You can weave with words and thoughts. Tell your story, make your mark. You can help ideas spark. You have passion, you have zest. Use them on your writing quest. Look around and listen well. It's your job to touch, taste, smell. Classroom, kitchen, park, or fair, you're a writer everywhere. Writers are really observant, right, of what's going on around them all the time. Still staring at an empty page, every writer knows that stage. Ask what if, change your view. Try a pen or stick that's new. You might stumble, you might sigh, but readers, writers read and draft and fly. Don't give up, you're doing fine. Try juicy words, they're more than nice. Juicy words have spunk and spice. Use details too, the super tool that boosts your words like rocket fuel to let you show instead of tell and cast your magic writer's spell. And if your story won't ignite, choose another thing to write. Jot a journal, journal, sing your song, try a slogan, short and strong, pen a poem, type a text, write a thank you at your desk. And when the word stream starts to flow, get it down now, swift or slow, cut and paste and edit later. You're the boss, you're the creator. Scribe by night or draft by day, 
you have mighty things to say. Hear the stories in your head, bake them into epic bread, write to share your hopes and notions or to sort out tough emotions. Tallest tales or stories true, they are gifts designed by you. So think them up, write them down, cause you are what? A writer. And writers are readers and readers are writers and writers are readers, right? You can just keep spinning that book around, right? That is so crazy. I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a moment. I'm guessing you guys are awesome listeners. So thank you for that, right? That's so much fun. Thank you so much um, for listening so well. So um, reading and writing, why is this part of the same book? because they're really two sides of the same coin. Now they're two sides of the same book, right? So um, I read a quote that said, reading is like breathing in and writing is like breathing out, right? Do you ever feel like that? So if I said it a different way, I always think of myself and all of us as a very special story stew. So you have all kinds of ingredients that are particular to you right? So reading is like gathering in your ingredients for your stew, right? And then writing is like making the actual stew, right? So the story stew, we're all, we all have different memories and experiences and ways of seeing the world, things we've done, places we've been, books we've read, right? So in order to be a writer, you really need to pull in, I'll do some different things, right? Go for a walk and turn over a rock and see what's underneath. Try a new food that you haven't tried before. Um, try a new sport or activity, right? There's all different kinds of things that you can do to build up your story stew. And that will help you to become a, a more interesting writer because right? you have interesting things to write about. So this is something that parents can help, right? I'm thinking, what things can I give my kids to write about, whether we're going for a walk or we're going to pick apples, it's gonna be fall, you know, things like that, that are really, um, there's a lot of senses going on. And like I said, you're a writer anywhere, right? So you are experiencing all these different things, even if you're not writing about it right at that moment. Um, so something that I wanted to talk about in light of that is why, so you have your story too, story stew. But why does that make writing such a superpower, right? Reading and writing are your superpowers. That was the title of our presentation. So what is it about writing that is so amazing? Let's see, all right, can you see that? When you create, when you're your story, Stu, and you create a book or a poem or whatever it is, you're making something that wasn't there before. That's like amazing. And this is true whether you're building a Lego, right? If you build a Lego, you build something, a creation that wasn't there before. Um, anything that you create, you make a recipe and that's empowering, right? And writing lets us share ideas. So you might read things that were written by people that live in a very different place or they live in a different time right? So you can share ideas, you can share your thoughts, and then you can also read other people's thoughts. Um, I showed you my vintage diary, right? You can express yourself and how you're feeling. Sometimes it helps to work through feelings to write them down, even if you don't share them with anyone, it's just for you. Um, writing lets you think more clearly. So the principle of the schools that my kids go to said, clear writing is clear thinking. Just think about that for a minute. That is so true. When I sit at staring at an empty page or an empty computer screen and I don't know what to write, it's because I don't know what I'm thinking about yet, right? I don't know what I want to say. So writing can help you figure out. Sometimes you have to actually start writing and then I get a page into it and I'm like, oh, that's what I wanted to say, even though I just filled up a page with blah, 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 blah. right? So it helps you figure out your thinking and writing helps you use your voice, right? So the world needs your stories and your passion and your experiences, right? So we want to hear from you as a writer. Now, can um, I, oh, can yeah, I go ask ahead. you a question, April? Of course. Um, when we're talking about using our voice, mm -hmm. 
um, we have something kind of unique happening tonight that you don't get to have happen very often. I mean, when I read someone else's writing, you can hear an inner voice that you know goes with the words, but you don't always know the actual voice. <laughs> right. And and because you're reading your own book to us tonight, I'm afraid that I will never hear any voice but that voice. Again, I'm saying that's a wonderful thing. That's a unique thing that we get to do. And it, I've had, I have a short list of authors that I've met or heard speak that have that happen. But when you're talking about your voice, can you, can you clarify that just a little bit? What, right. What so I think you're saying sort of like the literal voice, right? The voice, so the voice like, the, yeah. The, the voice that you literally hear. I mean, use your voice like, um, so if I have a, a subject that I'm, I'm passionate about or a candidate that I really want to vote for and I want to spread the word, maybe I'm going to write a letter to the editor or something like that. To, I, I feel like that's using my voice, right? So that I'm not actually speaking it, but by writing, I'm putting my voice into the mix and I'm standing up for what, what I believe. Well, right. I, so using your voice is a sort of a um, sort of a metaphor. Right. So like not always the voice that we hear. But I also I also can I can I say this about your style um, is that when I was reading this book that you just read to us, I hadn't heard you read it before, but I'd heard you read other things. But I recognized your your voice in the way that you put words together and the way that you constructed your sentences. And that helped me to hear you when I was reading it, I, I couldn't help it. I, I, I heard the voice I'd actually hear you speak. And so they both went together. Right. So a lot of that, I'm, I'm not gonna continue to harp on that. I just- No, it's interesting because voice is also something as a writer that you know we talk about, we have characters and we have a setting where our story takes place. We have the plot, which is the action, but we have voice, right? So the voice of a story is really important, right? So like, if you think of something like, Hollow Moon. Does anybody know this book? So it's really mellow. It's about, um, it's by Jane Yolen and it's a beautiful book. Um, she used, or her husband used to take her kids out when they reached a certain age to go owling at night. So they had to be very quiet. So the voice of the book is very quiet, but you can also have um, rambunctious kind of silly voices, right? Does anybody know, I want my hat back? This is a very silly book. It has a very sort of deadpan voice, right? Have you seen my hat? No, I have not seen any hats around here. Okay, thank you anyway. Right? It's a very different voice. So you get to develop your own voice and you might have a different voice for different things that you write, right? I love that. Thank you for bringing Fantastic. that up. We have one of our, our uh, attendees mentions that your personality comes out in it. Oh, good. Right. And that's, I think that's true um, of voice in general, right? Like that your personality comes through in what you write and depending on what you're trying to share, right? So this is something that I'm really passionate about, right? Reading and writing. This is like my whole, um, such a love for me, right? So that I hope that it comes through and I hope it comes through. This book is like, this is my, uh, my, what do you call it? Pom pom, because I'm like a cheerleader, right? So I feel like this book is like your own little cheerleader, portable, you can take with you, right? Because I want you to do your reading and your writing. And I don't want you to say to yourself, I'm not a reader, or I'm not a writer. Because we all have to be readers and writers to get through the day, right? Maybe you're only writing a list, right? Maybe you're reading a text message. You got to do it to navigate the world. So it's worth working at, right? So you are a reader, right? You heard it here. So reading is so awesome. So feeding your brain, right? It also feeds your heart, right? Humans have been telling stories for thousands and thousands of years. Before we had written language, we were telling, doing oral storytelling and many um, cultures still do that. And it's wonderful. The story changes a little bit as it goes, but there's something about storytelling, right? That strikes a chord in your, in your heart. Reading lets us go new places. It's like a magic carpet, especially during these times when we're not traveling as much, right? Reading lets you go other places, meet people that you might not otherwise meet. Uh, pretty incredible, right? That you can, um, you can sort of travel through a book. 
um, reading lets you learn new things and try them out before you might actually do them in your life. So it could be things like making decisions, like what if I chose to do that? But maybe it's also playing golf or whatever it is. Did you know, so there's a thing called an MRI where it like scans your brain. And when somebody reads about something like a golf swing, the same part of their brain is activated as if they were actually doing it. So it actually activates these, you know, you're not actually doing it, but you're sort of role playing a little bit, which I think is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, like I said about the diary, reading helps you understand yourself a little bit better. Um, reading helps you learn new words, so new vocabulary, oodles of them, oodles, that's a juicy word, right? So when we are talking to each other, just in everyday language, we tend to use the same words over and over again. And when you're reading books, it's like three times as many different words, right? So that's, um, they call them novel, not like a novel, like you're reading a novel, but novel, like new, new words that you might be exposed to. The more words you know, and the more words you understand, the more words you might use in your own writing, right? So it really makes everything richer. Um, reading helps build connections in your brain. Your brain has these things called neurons. These are little stuffed neurons. They communicate with each other. And when you're reading, different parts of your brain are activated and they start connecting to each other. So it really, you really are getting smarter when you're reading. Um, and becoming, a, reading more makes you a better writer. So if you wanna be a better writer, you need to write, of course, right? You need to practice. But really what you need to do is read because think about it. If you've never heard a word or read a word, are you gonna use that word in your writing? If you have never read a beautiful sentence, are you gonna be able to write a beautiful sentence? Reading, pull all of that in, right? Breathe all that reading in so that you can breathe it out as you're writing. Right? I, I think uh, I've had the experience, and I don't know if you have, where I've read words that then I used them and found out that in my head I'd been pronouncing them wrong. <laughs> Yes. All along. Uh, I, and I, I think, I, I mean, there were college professors that I heard using words and I'm like, I'm, I'm not sure that's the, how you pronounce that. But, but that, that kind of expanding of your vocabulary can only come um, through reading. Uh, my kids have often uh, used words that I, I'm like, you read that. I know that that's where you got that <laughs> word because you haven't heard me say it or anybody else. <laughs> so, so speaking to that as a parent, um, I've got kids of ages young to not so young. Um, is there anything that, that parents can do to encourage that sort of vocabulary building reading at home? Yes, exactly. So it's so important to, um, to try to create a culture of reading at home, right? And when you think about the role that parents and caregivers can play, in that, so let's think about it. at school, your teachers are, it's the art and craft of teaching how to read, right? So at home, we may not be teaching how to read, we might not know how to do that, but we wanna create a love of reading, right? So you don't need to be so concerned with the technical aspects, but you wanna create a culture of reading. So um, we were talking a little bit about this, about getting caught reading. So letting your kids see you reading, right? And if you're reading on your iPad or your phone or your other device, maybe saying to them, I'm reading a book, I'm not reading the news or I'm not playing a game, right? I'm reading right now. Um, and I tend to read a lot, a lot of people do this right before they go to bed. Well, guess who can see me? No one, my kids are already sleeping, <laughs> hopefully. So, right, so like trying to read when, when your family members can see you is really important. Um, and talking about what you read, what you read, what they're reading, um, and just making that part of your daily life and part of your family, I think is really important. Um, having books and a variety of different types of books and reading materials, comic books, magazines, like we said, instructions, all kinds of different things around the house. Our house, like we have books in every room right? We have books in the car. Um, so just having books just everywhere to make it easy to pick them up 
And also, you know, if you have more than one kiddo or you're helping to do some carpooling, you might have kids in the car at different times and you have some have to wait for each other. So having a book that you can stash in your bag and you can read it while you're waiting for your sister's dance class to finish, right? Or you're waiting for a doctor's appointment. Um, so my, I have a kiddo who reads in the car. A lot of people can't read in the car, but he does it all the time. Um, so that can be good ways to sneak in extra minutes of reading. Um, like I said, talking about what you're reading, um, helping kids find reading material is really important. So letting them choose is really, really, really important because it's something like 89% of kids say they're more likely to read something that they get to choose themselves, but it might be harder than you think for them to find something to read. So helping expose them to lots of different types of things and being open to things like graphic novels and comics and um, really any kind of reading material can be a pathway to the next thing. So helping them, um, you know, consulting with a librarian, a teacher, um, other kids, right, can be really good. What are you reading, you know, so that you can compare notes and maybe even trade. Um, we have a friend that we like to shop each other's bookshelves, right? So like, what do you have? What do I have? Um, so finding interesting reading material. And then, I, like I said, like not discounting any certain kind. Um, and I also, you were talking about voice. I really love audiobooks and listening mm -hmm. to them. So that can be a really fun family activity, either in the car, if you're taking a, a road trip, um, it's a little bit harder. We used to listen and we'd be like, well, everyone has to go to the grocery store because if you're going to put the audiobook on, we can't miss part of it, right? We have to <laughs> know what's going to happen. Um, you know, when you see people pulling up and they sit in the driveway and you're like, what are they doing? We're still listening to the audiobook. Um, and even just like if you're doing chores, like, okay, we're going to have 15 minutes of cleaning. Everybody go, you know, we'll put the book on and everybody clean up your stuff. Um, so, and those are things where then you've all, you're all reading the same story. It's like watching the same movie, right? So you can talk about that. Um, and we were talking a little bit about having sort of having this little um, piece on the upper right on your screen about the, the books in your home. The oh, yeah. studies and research talk about having um, that really performance, academic performance and life performance is really about the number of books in your house as opposed to like the number of hours that you're um that you're spent reading so um in relation to this i think teachers and librarians and things like that can do a lot of the same thing right be a role model as a reader um show what you're reading talk about what you're reading maybe post some teachers post posters of like i you know these are the books that i read over the summer because it opens the door for people to say hey i read that too have you read this i really loved it um and i know teachers are so pressed for time but if you can still carve out time for some in-class reading in a class read aloud, which really creates a classroom culture, like we said, like I always remember my fourth grader read, um, or the class read Charlotte's Web in fourth grade. It was a really bonding experience because that's a kind of an emotional story. Um, and the other thing that I think happens a lot at school because of the way we need to teach things is that you might have writer's workshop and you might have daily five or in a uh, um, reading um, block of time when sometimes you can bring those things together and have a literacy block. So maybe you're um, showing an example of brilliant beginnings of stories and then you're gonna try it out. So you might read some beginnings then try to write those beginnings and integrate them a little more. Um, I don't know if anybody else does this, but I tend to, when I come across a really beautiful sentence or a really interesting idea, I have a thing called a commonplace book where I write it down. This thing has seen better days, right? It's got like post-its and stuff all over it. It's used, um, but writing down interesting quotes and things can I come back to it later. Conceive it, believe it, achieve it, right? Things that might be inspiring. Here's a funny one from Abraham Lincoln. Dear General, if you do not want to use the army, I would like to borrow it for a few days. <laughs> this one was the war, very funny. Um, so just, the, you know, things that I like, but you can do that in the classroom too by having like an anchor chart where you might have, um, if you're reading a book and you're like, oh, this has, a, this has a juicy word in it. I'm gonna write down what it is and keep adding to it all year. So everybody can see those juicy words up on the wall and might get inspired to use them. And everybody feels a little ownership of it because everybody's been contributing to it. Um, and one of my favorites is a graffiti wall. So if you haven't seen one of these, um, 
there's a wonderful literacy advocate named Donna Lynn Miller. And I read about this in one of her books, but basically it's people writing quotes from um, different, like whatever they're reading at the moment, right? So this one on the upper left, when given the choice between being right and being kind, choose kind. Has anybody read this book? You guess what it's from? Wonder, right? So, um, so that's a fun way to just um, pull people in and sort of give book recommendations without talking about the whole, the whole book. So lots of things that we can do. Um, and I think Wes, you have some um, resources that are from my website that you can paste into the chat. And I pasted, done I that. pasted okay. one right in there, if you can see it, folks. Okay, fabulous. I'm gonna actually stop my screen share so you guys can see us a little bit better. But ton, there's tons of um, both kids activities on my website. So things like a literacy bingo and a word search and a Mad Lib, if you ever do those, like those are fun activities to engage in, but also lots of resources for parents and caregivers of how you can nurture your readers and writers at home and find book recommendations and different things like that. There's a lot there. So I think we are gonna have a little um, writing contest that we might uh, put a little challenge out to you. What do you think? We are, yeah. One of the great things about knowing April is she's so much fun and so inspiring. And uh, last time she did a webinar with us, we did a children's challenge with her where we had uh, everybody write a fractured fairy tale. And then we went through the entries and sent her uh, a, an edited down list of them <laughs> for her to read. And April was so generous with her time. She read them all. She sent comments to the writers and encouragement. And we want to do that again. So if you're willing, April, we'd like to do a children's challenge with a couple of your story starters that you have on your website that are so much fun. And we would like to launch it October 1st and we'll put up details of how to do it on our website um, at Treehouse, which is www.treehousemuseum.org. And we will then let everybody think about juicy words and brilliant beginnings <laughs> and all those great things um, and then submit it to us by November 1st and then we'll um, read through them and send our favorites on to April for her input yeah so Excellent. it's a great opportunity so thank that you that is so that. fabulous I'm so excited about it to get you guys writing so I actually have some little tips for you to um to put into your tool basket of, um, of writing strategies. So let me pull that up. All right, so you are a juicy writer, right? Not just a writer, you're a juicy writer. So these are some tips about how you can bring your writing to life. So using your senses, so we know you have five senses, right? Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, right? So pulling those into your writing, whether you're writing about something that happened to you, that actually happened, or something that you are making up. If you think about sort of like play the scene like a movie in your mind and think about what your character might be seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting, right? If you're gonna illustrate a story, we can see some of that in the pictures. That's why picture books are so awesome, but we can't smell things and it's hard to feel things, right? Touching things through your book. So those can be really wonderful senses to bring in. Here's a couple of examples. Does anybody know the book Jabari Jump? I love this book so much. So Jabari is not sure if he's gonna go off the high dive or not. And so when he gets up to the top, Jabari stood up straight. He walked all the way to the end of the board, his toes curled around the rough edge. That's so good. It's so juicy, <laughs> right? Last Stop on Market Street is also a beautiful book, right? So here's a description of the rain. The air, the outside air smelled like freedom. What does freedom smell like? But it also smelled like rain, which freckled CJ's shirt and dripped down his nose. 
freckled. Have you ever heard the word freckled used like that? What do you think that means? It's not freckles on his face, right? Little freckles of sprinkle, right? So that's some really wonderful sensory language. So use your senses. I have five tips for you. So this is number two. Try comparing. Do you know what hail is? It doesn't hail very often, but this is what hail looks like. Whoa. That's, sorry, that's very loud, at least in my ears. Hail is like these rocks right here. Um, it's, it's ice and it can be huge. And a lot of people say, oh, the hail was as big as golf balls, right? So there are lots of ways that we can compare. So in Golden Locks and the Three Pirates, which some of you have heard, Golden Locks compares a lot of things, right? So she says, this stool is hard as a turtle shell. This stool is soft as chicken feathers. Soon the stool was sturdy as a sea chest, right? So comparing one thing to another helps us visualize it. Here's an example from a wonderful book called No Monkeys, No Chocolate by Melissa Stewart. Um, she says, cocoa pods are the fruits of the cocoa tree. They look like small lumpy footballs growing on the tree's trunk and main branches. Small lumpy footballs. Have you ever seen a cocoa pod? I actually have, but before I had, they really do look like small lumpy footballs. And you can picture what a small lumpy football looks like, right? We've all seen a football, right? So try comparing to help your reader visualize. Be specific. So instead of saying, I saw a bird, well, what was it? Was it a big bird? Was it a cardinal? Was it a toucan? Those kind of birds look very different, right? And they appear in different places. So instead of using, I'm not using any more words, but by saying, I saw a toucan instead of I saw a bird, then I know, right? I know immediately what that's like. So in Snowy Race, which is a book that I wrote um, that came out last year, instead of saying, I got out of the truck, I said, I scoot, then scramble out the door, right? So some juicy words, but also, you know, you can picture scooting, right? You got to scoot to the edge and then scramble. You're going fast. It's more interesting than just saying, I got out of the truck. This is a funny letter that I got when my son was in first grade trying to convince me that he should have a pet fish. And he was very specific. She, he didn't just say, we'll take good care of it. He said, we'll keep it company by watching it swim. We can feed it. We won't feed it too much. And we will watch it to make sure it doesn't jump away. And we will have a birthday party for it. That was the, that was cinched it. You're having a birthday party for that fish. You're already going to love this fish, right? So being specific, he didn't just say, I'll take good care of it. I knew he was really going to take good care of it because he gave me specifics. So juicy words, you already know about juicy words, but they are words that are exciting. Stumble, guzzle, simmer, scribe, zest, grit. All of these words are words that are in the reader's and writer's book, right? So using words that are fun to read. This is from Dig In. Dump truck rumbles down the road. That's kind of onomatopoeia. It's a word that sounds like what it is. It rumbles. Dozer spreads a scrumptious load. This is a book for very little people. It's a board book. But do we have to use simple language? Right? We want to experience that vocabulary and those new words, right? So let's give you a chance to do some new juicy words. So I could say to you, how was your week? And you might say, great. Great is like a word that I find myself using all the time. I kind of overuse it. My mom doesn't use the word great anymore because I'm always harassing her about it, right? So what are some other words that you could put in the chat that would mean the same thing? So my week was excellent. It was fabulous. It was epic. Do you have any ideas that you want to share for words that mean about the same thing as great? But are more exciting. While people are thinking, while chat. people are doing this, I have to say, I uh, I was halfway writing an email to you um, <laughs> when uh, when I got that you were going to be doing this, and I and I had to go back before I sent it and change every third word to make sure I wasn't <laughs> to make sure it wasn't great. Yeah. Ooh, amazing, colossal. You friends are good at this. Fantastic, we've got in there. Fantastic, ooh, magnificent and scrumptious. Oh, stellar, stellar, love it. Stellar's a really good one. Interesting. Interesting can mean a lot of different things, right? 
that's a very uh of a multi-purpose word tubular yeah. <laughs> i love it i haven't heard that one before <laughs> exciting radical that's a new one to me too how was your week it was radical right that pulls your your conversation or your reader in i think i went with brilliant instead of great brilliant ooh cosmic brilliant here are some that I had come up with and you you friends did a lot of these magnificent stellar stupendous extraordinary let's try one more how about the word said so when we're writing a lot of times we just use said right and that's fine but not always right we want to shake things up a little bit right so what are other words <laughs> Tremendous, Lynn, you're the best. <laughs> tremendous. My week was tremendous. <laughs> Cheers, treehouse. <laughs> Ooh, uttered. Okay, so instead of said, a character uttered to the other one, right? So it's another way to say it. What if you were going to say something quietly? How would you say it? Whisper. What if you were going to say something loudly? How could you? What do you think? <gasps> Boomed. Mm. Ooh. Shouted. Ooh, spat. Spat. That could be juicy because I might actually spit when I spat. <laughs> spat, I love. <sighs> Wonderful. We could have cried, questioned, wondered. So many. Feel free to keep them coming. Mumbled. Oh, yes. Mumbled is like when you have marbles in your mouth. All of these words are in the Golden Locks book. Thundered, boomed, shrieked, bellowed, stammered, echoed, cried, agreed, sputtered, interrupted, howled, mumbled, growled, roared. All of them in that book. Um, replied. We have whispered, right? So, so many different things. You don't want to replace every time the character says said with a different word, but shaking it up a little bit. Makes it, more, makes it more fun for you as the reader, as the writer, and it makes it more fun for your reader. Okay, so the last one is show, don't tell. So what does this mean? Show, don't tell. I talk about that in readers, writers. Oozed. <laughs> Oozed is a very juicy word. So when you show, don't tell, instead of telling your reader something, you're going to try to show them. A lot of times we use it for feelings. So instead of saying, we're so excited. Instead, I said, almost there. We whoop and yell. So I know, right? I know you're excited. Certain feelings feel a different way. So here's from Jabari jumps again. Jabari watched the other kids climb the long ladder. Looks easy, Jabari said. But when dad squeezed his hand, Jabari squeezed back. How do you think Jabari feels? He's dad squeezing his hand and he's squeezing back, right? You might be feeling a little nervous, right? So lots of times if you feel excited, your body feels a certain way, right? Your heart might be racing. Um, you might feel like you have a lot of energy, like you just ate all your Halloween candy, right? You have lots of energy. If you feel nervous, what happens to your palms sometimes? If you feel nervous, sometimes like your little sweaty palm. They right? get juicy. Mm -hmm. They get juicy palms, right? Exactly. Um, you might get a little like queasy, your butterflies in your stomach, right? So being able to show instead of tell can be really um, can really help your writing come to life. So there's your summary of your strategies, right? I know you can do it and use these different things in your writing to really um, help it be stellar, stellar writing. Ooh, gasped. I love that instead of said gasped. Absolutely. So this is one of my very favorite quotes from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So please, oh please, we beg, we pray, go throw your TV set away, and in its place you can install a lovely bookshelf on the wall. <laughs> very silly, right? You don't have to throw your TV set away, but um, but well, that nowadays, is limiting nowadays your screen time <laughs> so that you have time to um, so, so that you have time to read. Um, but if you friends have any questions about reading, about writing, about literacy, about books. I, like I said, I'm very um, involved in all different aspects of books. So any behind the scenes, 
secrets that you um, that you are curious about, please feel free to let me know, and I will do my best to answer them. Ooh, somebody said guffawed instead of said guffawed. So we, we had one question about um, other kinds of writing. I'm going to paraphrase mm -hmm. a little bit, but it was a question about songwriting, and and is that a is it a different process for getting your well, song or in order and down on paper? Wes, I think you might have to answer that because I'm not really sure, but I will say that writing picture books is a lot like writing poetry, like a poem that goes across all of the pages. So I have more experience writing poetry. Um, the thing I would say about songs is that with poetry in a book, you want to have it so the rhythm and the meter, if you're writing that kind of poetry, not free verse, um, so that it's it's like Dr. Seuss where everyone reads it the same way, right? You don't wanna force someone to put the accent on the wrong part of the word that they wouldn't naturally do. But I think there's a little more leeway in songwriting. So I don't know what you think about that yeah, because I'm, you're at liberty to sing it how you want. Unless you're sting and then it has to be strict meter. Um, okay. But, if, if, uh, but you get a little bit, you can fudge it with, <laughs> with lyrics. I, I, I want to say this about reading too. Um, we musicians look at notes on a page and they're doing the same thing. They're reading in the same way that a Lego builder looks at symbols and reads. And all of those things are reading skills. They're all part of what it takes to be a reader. Exactly. And reading pictures, I think, is more and more important these days, right? It's all part of reading and they're all important. So if you love to read the pictures and you love to read music, you are a reader. And I, I wanna say if symbols are reading, then that explains why my dryer has the same <laughs> symbol for go that my, uh, I used to have something called a tape player and it, and it had the same symbol to play the tape that it has to start my laundry. Um, because we speak that language worldwide. We speak those symbol languages. Exactly, right? And that's why, um, I don't know about you, but I really like emojis too. That's kind of a fun universal language that we can share. I work with a lot of illustrators that like Christine Davinier is French. She speaks English, but it's I, I work with illustrators that don't speak as much English. And it's really nice to be able to use emojis. Just a long, a long symbol, bunch of cats and a porcupine <laughs> and, and a smile, and you got your point across. It's like hieroglyphs. Yeah. Right. And there was a question uh, about what you're working on next. Oh, well, I normally am working on more than one thing at a time, because if I get stuck on one, then I put it aside for a little bit, put it in the drawer and come back to it. But I'm working on two different ideas about libraries. So shock, right? <laughs> I love um, <laughs> love books and libraries. Um, I just became a um, trustee at my local library and read a book called Palaces for the People, which is um, what Andrew Carnegie called libraries. And I think that's so true, kind of like Treehouse, right? Where like lots of different kinds of people come and they fill, they fill that well, right? They fill their their stew pot. Um, so working on a couple of different ideas about that. And I'm also working on a picture book about building bridges, not actually building the bridges, but like figurative bridges, right? Reaching out to other people. So good question. So some fiction and some nonfiction. We have, I know at least one librarian with us uh, today. So we'll be looking forward eagerly to to uh, more information about your library book. Um, we have a question uh, about what your favorite juicy word is. I can only assume that <laughs> oh that changes gosh. day to day. I have to pick one. Um, it's, it is funny when you find yourself using certain words across different books. So I've noticed that I use the word soar a lot, S-O-A-R in different context. Um, I wouldn't say that's my favorite juicy word. I think my favorite juicy word is flucky. Flucky. So fluck is like courage and bravery, right? And where did I put my book? Um, 
so I finally got the chance to use it in this book, right? When I'm talking about different characters, I say, when favorite stories steal your heart, they're brave and strong with clever wit, style, pluck, or downright grit. Right? So it's always fun when you get to use your juicy word. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, we've got pirate fans who are asking, <laughs> is there a possibility of a sequel or another pirate book in the future? Well, I don't know if there'll be another pirate book, but I will say that pirates were really fun. It's really, really fun to write about. So if you can figure out a way to incorporate pirates into the writing challenge, you know, I could be swayed of, you know, really cottoning up to that story. Um, but I did think that it would be funny to write a night dragon version of um, the three pigs. But I don't know if that's going to happen, right? right? So instead of having the wolf, you'd have the dragon, right? And the knights would build their castles. Fun. So fractured fairy tales are fun too. If you're interested in writing fractured fairy tales, there's an organizer on my website where you can look at that and see um, sort of how to do it. It's like, it's fun because you already have a structure of the story, right? You don't have to start from scratch. You have to be careful putting out things like that. You better write it quick. Because you just <laughs> told that put it out there. to a room full of writers <laughs> who are eager oh to boy, read that because... book when you write it. <laughs> If I haven't written it yet, then I think it's fair game, right? Like, but you're right. You have to be, you have to be a little careful. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so excited to see um, what you friends might write. And I'm also curious what you're reading. What, the, what is everybody reading right now? Like Wes, you said you like to read on your, on your phone. What are you reading at the moment? Um, I don't want to tell you what I'm reading because I'm disappointed in it and I don't want oh, okay. one so of you have my favorite favorites? authors to be disappointed. But I, I tend, I got to tell you, I'm a sword and sorcery kind of guy. Okay. And so I find myself going there, whether it's the classics. I reread okay. uh, the Iliad uh, not too long Ooh. ago to make myself seem cool. Um, but I, I, I have, before the one I'm reading right now, I was reading some Tad Williams memory okay. sorrow thorn was really good okay i'm gonna write that down because i have a lord of the rings fan at home oh yeah Add Williams. okay i, I gotta to say as a parent as a parent i can't tell my kids i've got some of my kids on this webinar so don't listen to this <laughs> i i can't tell my kids that they should read a certain book because my kids are all of the age now where if i say you should read this they definitely won't and so, so what you need to do is you just, just need to around. put it on the coffee table or the kitchen island or just you just need to plant it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's definitely not what I'm doing when I leave those books around. <laughs> so kids, when you see, you know, books just appear, maybe like on your pillow. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing subtle maybe about that's, that. Maybe that's what it was. What else, what else panelists are you reading? What have you, I know, or are, what are, are you reading? Too. What are you reading? Yeah, tell me like, tell me what your what your favorites are. I've been reading The Secret Garden because we're all into that at Treehouse lately. <laughs> right, for next week, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, but so you're getting in the spirit. I am, but you know, we have just loved your book. We've all been reading it and had it, such a good time and we want to share it. Um, I actually have copies to give away. So maybe now's a good moment. Can I do that? Yes, absolutely. Um, we just went through everybody who registered for the webinar and um, looking to see who checked in. And so we're going to give several books away. Um, and here's how you get your book. If your name is one I read, just come in anytime next week or give us a call and we'll arrange for you to pick it up here. And if you don't live close to Treehouse, let us know and we'll work that out too. So Haley M., you get a book. Melissa B. gets a book. Deborah R. and Caitlin P. You are our winners. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> Excellent. You're going to get a juicy word pencil. Oh, cool. Oh, in April, we lost you there for a second. We lost your sound. Sorry about that. So I was talking about juicy word pencils and a juicy bookmark where you can write down your favorite juicy words on there. Oh, that's great. So congratulations. 
thank you for giving those away. I hope you will enjoy. Well, and I forgot to mention that April has generously also sent me a care package with some book plates. So if you want a book, you yeah. can get a book plate to put in with April's signature. So that makes it even cooler. We also, Absolutely. Uh, just in case you didn't win, and I was not on that list, I'm sorry. Um, if you didn't win, we are selling them here at Treehouse. Um, but also check out the links we put earlier um, for all of the activities that go along with these books and others. And, and do yourself a favor and just, just surf around on April's own personal little website there to appreciate some of the other things that, of hers that, that you may or may not have, have read. And there are a lot of resources there in those two links that we put on for us. There are lots of places that you can look for book recommendations and lots of places that you can even um, make your own books and publish them if you want to. Lots of different reading and writing activities. So, um, so yeah, so feed your brains. I guess that is, that is our big message, right? Feed your brains with all different kinds of experiences and then let them come out through your pencil, right? Because books don't come, even though we love the magic of Treehouse, books don't come from magic wands. They come from your pencil and your brain, right? Your own special stories do in there. So I'm so grateful for this opportunity to talk to all of you from so far away. As crazy as technology can be, it's really special for things like this. So thank you for having me back and for celebrating this book with me. Thank you so much for sharing it with us and for doing this with us. We have a couple more thanks that we, that we do need to give. Um, we want to remind everybody that this is a Utah Humanities uh, Book Festival entry, and we are, we are here um, thanks in part to them. And we want to give our thanks to some of the major sponsors of the Book Festival, the George S. and Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation, Salt Lake City Arts Council, Salt Lake City Zoot Arts and Parks Fund, they should just call it ZAP, we do, <laughs> so, Summit County RAP, Weber County RAMP, the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, the King's English Bookshop, Weller Bookworks, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Catalyst. And if you enjoyed, or, or even if you didn't enjoy what you just experienced, although I think you are a person without a soul if you didn't enjoy it, um, we, uh, there is a survey from Utah Humanities, and we will be sending an email to all of you who attended um, asking you to, to fill out that survey. So there'll be more information about that. We want to thank uh, uh, Seychelle. I, I remember your name right. Uh, our, our sign language interpreter. Uh, we want to thank our Treehouse Executive Director, Lynn Goodwin, for handling and arranging everything behind the scenes. And of course, once again, to April Jones Prince, thank you so much for coming and, uh, and doing this for us again. We can't wait to see you and all of you here in person at Treehouse. Excellent. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Thank evening. Thank you.